Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink. As far as it goes, 1939 was a pretty exciting year. A gallon of gas was only 10 cents, The Wizard of Oz was premiering in theaters, and New York's World Fair had just begun its now legendary run. Oh, and let's not forget the start of the Second World War. Alongside of these heady events, an observant viewer may have noticed an exciting new trend in disposable entertainment, the comic book. While the format had been in existence for a few years at that point, it was the advent of the superhero that pushed these four-color fantasies to the forefront of the public consciousness. The success of National Comics Superman in 1938 led to a slew of imitators, emulators, and folks just looking to cash in. Almost overnight, comic books became part of the American landscape, and these comic books needed creators, a fact that did not go unnoticed in Oxford, Maryland. Fletcher Hanks began taking drawing lessons at the age of 23. It was a late start, but for Hanks, it would be a brief journey. Born in 1887, Hanks was a young adult when he began his studies at the W. L. Evans Correspondence School. At a dollar a lesson, he learned the basics of his craft, dutifully following the critiques written on the back sides of his returned assignments. While few examples of this work survive, what does exist shows Hanks to be a dedicated and motivated student. The young man was clearly serious when it came to learning his craft, but there was another side of the creator as well. Like many of the creatively bent, Hanks enjoyed a drink and a smoke and a wink and a joke. His carousing nature and love of physical sports like baseball provided balance, but keeping these elements in harmony would prove to be a daunting task. Early in his career, Hanks was commissioned to paint murals on his rich patron's walls, images we can only imagine as they are lost to the passage of time. Hanks used these proceeds from the commissions to entertain his friend, fueling a taste for high times and alcohol we are to understand would carry on throughout his life. By 1930, Hanks was married with four children. By the end of that decade, it's said he'd abandoned his family and was living on his own. Whatever the case, by 1939, Fletcher Hanks found himself in search of a new direction, and the burgeoning comics medium appeared to offer the best path forward. However, unlike many other individuals filing in to provide labor, Hanks was fairly unique, as he offered the entire package. He wrote, drew, and lettered his own stories, an unlikely auteur at the dawn of the medium. His unique vision and drive ensured that his work found placement. In the space of just two years, Fletcher Hanks produced content for several publishers under no less than six different names. From 1939 to 1941, readers were treated to some of the most unconventional and unexpected comics content the medium would see, with Hanks delivering no less than 51 individual tales, and then, he vanished. All of the stories that we're looking at today come from the Fantagraphics publications I Shall Destroy All Civilized Worlds and the companion volume You Shall Die by Your Own Evil Creation. The publisher has done an exceptional job reproducing these Golden Age tales, collecting all of Hank's work into two bountiful volumes. If you enjoy this episode, please consider purchasing these books at your local comic shop. 
While many of his peers toiled away on characters they had nothing to do with, Hanks created his own heroes and villains. Most notable is the now notorious Stardust the Super Wizard, an oddly proportioned hero with a penchant for skin-tight leotards and poetic vengeance. Stardust was Hank's first published creation, and the one to which he affixed his own name, and not a nom de plume. Let's join the Super Wizard now, in a tale that could only be called Jip Clip's Anti-Gravity Ray. From his asteroid observatory, Stardust considers the action happening on Earth below. Seems Jip Clip and his gang are set to stop the planet revolving with their gravity-arresting anti-solar ray. One problem. Once the planet stops spinning, all of the people will fall off. But that's no big deal as the criminals have decided to simply chain themselves down. Then, once all of humanity is floated away, why, they'll have the planet to themselves. Stardust is understandably concerned. All of those floating corpses are going to block his telescope's view. Jip gets right to it, firing his ray up and slowing the spinning sphere until it finally loses all motion. And there they go. Without gravity to hold them down, people just shoot into the stratosphere like popcorn out of a skillet. And where's Stardust? Well, he's on his way. I hope they can hold their breath for a while. Oh. Crap. Apparently they can't. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Jip prepares to shut down his ray and restart the Earth's rotation. And because sharing the world with two other guys is just too much, Jip shoots his partners. Pretty cold, but hey, I'm sure he's got his reasons. Above the planet, Stardust has used his uncanny power to link all of the floating people together and draw them back to Earth. Kind of a specific power, but hey... He's the super wizard, not me. Below, Jip gloats, but his words catch in his throat as the populace of the planet is returned, thanks to Stardust. The criminal decides to hide in his lab, but there is no hiding from justice. Stardust appears and picks the guy up like an empty Fritos bag, surely crushing his spine before chucking him off the rooftop and into outer space. But it doesn't stop there. Jip is then placed in a chamber hanging in the empty vacuum of space, where he promptly freezes to death. Meanwhile, back on Earth, we're told things have already returned to normal. Huh. I think folks would at least need a nap after that. Pretty wild stuff. But Stardust wasn't the only one to deal out such gruesome sentences. The super wizard had his mysterious match in the form of... Phantoma, the beautiful and terrifying protector of the jungle. Alternating between a gold-tressed goddess and a skull-faced creature so compelling she's since become iconic in her own right, Phantoma's distinctive appearance sees her leading the pack of Hank's enigmatic creations. Phantoma, the most remarkable woman in the world, uses her powers to protect the jungle. Today, it's from this guy. Our heroine spies huge flaming clawed hands sweeping through the sward. And hey, they're grabbing people. And animals. Phantoma scans the trees until she discovers the mostly hidden lair of angel eyes. Oh sure, laugh all you want, but Angel Eyes here has a grudge against the jungle for killing his mom and pop. Mad with hate, the Deviant has created dangerous chemical creatures to wipe out all jungle life. Yowza! How we learn to do this isn't something we dwell on. Hey, the story's only six pages long, folks. Instead, we get right to it with Angel Eyes content in the destruction that he has unleashed. However, he didn't count on Phantoma, which is a pretty big mess step. I mean, protecting the jungle is kind of her whole bag. She appears before Eyes and tells him his parents died in an accident, but the guy ain't having it. Phantoma pleads, but the villain is determined to see his plan through. Almost sadly, Phantoma destroys the laboratory with a violent exertion of her willpower. Transforming into her more vengeful state, she whisks Angel Eyes from the ruins and hangs him high on a dead pine. At the same time, the Flaming Claws continue to cause all manner of chaos. 
Suddenly, the claws seem to lose their vengeful will, hanging limp. She gathers the now passive creatures before the pine and angel eyes, promising to return the beast's power if they turn on their former master. And turn they do, plucking the tree from the ground and giving it a good shake in the process. This is enough to kill angel eyes, and with the fun over, Fantoma has the corpse subsumed into a water spout. She dissipates the chemical creatures, and, reverting to liquid, they spill harmlessly into the jungle below. The day saved, Fantoma flies home, presumably to put her face back on. As you may have noticed, Hank's heroes aren't exactly proactive. When it comes to stepping into a conflict, they are a bit slow on the uptake, only throwing in once the offense has been inflicted. What this says about the creator's mindset is up for debate, but it's clear that Hanks had some very definite ideas about justice and how it should be meted out. Indeed, nearly 30 years before Steve Ditko's Randian heroes, Hanks had his characters enacting the same sort of brutal justice, albeit in a more creative fashion. While Ditko's characters were bound by the rules of form, Hanks went beyond form and into the realms of the abstract and absurd. What was in everyday parlance metaphorical was, in Hank's world, staggeringly literal. Stories turned on a single word, a character's fate often determined by a seemingly random utterance. Space Smith is on one of his regular interlunar trips, with gal pal Diana tagging along. They're cruising to the moon when their ship is suddenly attacked by thousands of Martian imp men. Using radium rays, the imps knock Space and Diana out and transmit them to Mars. They awaken in the lab of Skoma, a Mr. Weatherby-looking alien with an oversized noggin. Skoma isn't put out by his guest's incredulity. His big head is a sign of pride. He plans on trashing the Earth and then taking Diana for his queen. Space doesn't caught into this line of thinking, and he and Diana resist, as the imps set upon them. Diana grabs a pair of guns from the wall, but can't figure out how to work them, so they jump out of a nearby window. Unfortunately, a Martian mosquito catches sight of them and swoops in for the kill. Space does his best to avoid the winged nasty, but it soon has him in its powerful claw. Just then, Diana dopes out how the guns work and blasts the bug out of the sky. She and Space make a break for it, coming across a nearby way station. They knock out the guard and transport themselves back to Earth, with the grim knowledge that they must return to Mars in the future to confront the menace of Skoma. But it wasn't all completely bizarre. Some of Hank's stories hewed closer to conventional forms, like the sci-fi tale starring Buzz Crandall of the Space Patrol. And this one is only semi-bizarre. Buzz Crandall is the top crime buster in the universe. Hmm, maybe Space Smith should look him up. Buzz notices a mysterious ray being used against Venus, which is kind of a problem as he's on it. Buzz calls his assistant, Sandra, who's back on Earth. She reports the same sort of disturbances as on Venus, and Buzz moves to investigate. The two head into space to get to the bottom of it. And hey, here's your problem. You've got Lupus the Fiend gumming up your works. He's out to destroy all of the civilized planets, don't you know? It's a total dick move, but hey... Fiend is right there in his name. He pulls a pair of levers, always a sign of advanced technology, and Earth and Venus begin to hurtle towards one another. Sandra determines the source of the ray, but is knocked out by the Fiend for her trouble. Helpless, her ship is drawn to the star where Lepus is operating deep into an underground cavern. In a star, mind you. Sandra awakens to find herself captive of these sterling examples of physicality. Buzz, meanwhile, has managed to track Sandra and comes in for a landing, which delights the fiend to no end. See, kids? Get a job doing what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. Buzz does what Buzz does, blasting into the cavern and assaulting the guard. They're no fun. They fell right over. 
The pair take off, preparing to decimate the planet with the rapid-fire interplanetary gun. But their ship is downed by these truly terrifying fellows. Bring Visine! Lots and lots of Visine! The minions are ordered by mental command to bring the prisoners to the emerald gas chamber. From a distant golden tower watches the Thinker, who is determined to... You guessed it. Make Sandra his queen and Buzz another pawn. Man, I hate to say these bad guys are predictable. I guess there just isn't a lot of action in outer space. The headless minions breach the ship and Buzz lays into them. And check this out. Sandra calls him space and the narrator goes along with it. Don't you hate it when you're with a gal and she calls you by another guy's name? Meanwhile, on Earth... Uh, it's pretty cold and probably difficult to stand, what with the planet rocketing through the galaxy and all. In moments, both Earth and Venus are lined up with the Fiend driving them forward. At the same time, B Space and Sandra, who he now refers to as Diana, turn the ship on the star, which the narrator has decided is now a comet. Man, I'm getting confused. Luckily, the planets miss each other, and space has the chance to blast a tower into smithereens. And look, the planets are returning to their natural orbits. Good thing, too, as we've run out of pages. Firemen, flying planets, and hidden catacombs within stars, all within the space of eight pages. Man, that Hanks could really pack it in. For all that, an astute reader begins to notice certain recurring themes and motifs which come to be as used as reliably as a pencil and ink. Indeed, there's no mistaking one of the creator's tales, so singular is Hank's approach and vision. The heroes aren't just top-shelf physical specimens, they're lantern-jawed demigods whose craniums are dwarfed by their powerful frames. The villains aren't simply ugly, but instead the seeming manifestations of greed, avarice, and vice. To quote Nigel Tufnell, this one goes up to eleven. Big Red McLean is wandering through the north woods the way a fella does. Approaching a logging camp, he notes a brawl is broken out, and one of those varmints has pulled a knife. Being the upstanding moral sort, Red socks the offending party in the jaw, much to the anger of his compatriots. The group turns on the stranger, but they didn't reckon on Red's way around a fist and turn tail. It's then we meet Mr. Farr, a landowner whose trees are being cut and stolen in the night. Red, being a real mensch, offers to stick around and help to Farr's delight. Three nights later, Red's patience is finally rewarded when the loggers return. Our hero steps to, frightening some of the men off, while others opt to stay and fight. Even with axes, it's a one-way struggle, the virtuous Red walloping one and all. The stragglers run, and Red tosses their gear off a nearby cliffside. Savage! With that matter settled, our hero moves on to more important things, like breakfast. Always a place at the table, big guy. Whirlwind Carter, Big Red McLean, Tank Wilson, Taboo. These creations stand as symbolic representations of a particular mindset of one raised on early 20th century values and perceptions. The lack of detail or a character's backstory doesn't undermine them, but instead cements their role as a sort of outside vanguard, everyman American-type heroes, interchangeably decent, virtuous, and willing to kill to protect the greater good, at least as far as they see it. But Hanks appears to have been conflicted. His struggles with alcoholism and his violent temper made him a difficult and violent personality, costing the man his marriage and family. They also may have led to burnout, with the wild energy and inventiveness of Hanks' earlier work paling in the final days. As I said in the beginning, Fletcher Hanks only produced 51 stories. Unlike other creators whose work 
started slow and bloomed over the course of years or even decades, Hank's output exploded like a crate of TNT, impacting anything in its immediate vicinity before dying back to a distant echo. He'd ceased creating comics before many industry legends had even started, but Hank's work helped define the wild frontier that would become comics' golden age. His granite-hewn heroes, saucy space babes, and mind-bending monsters are raw, almost primitivist in nature, but establish a language where the only limits are the edges of the page. Looking to get ahead in crime? Well, you've come to the right place. Stardust's interplanetary eye is on Destructo, who's just completed plans for total world domination. And it's a scientific grift, see? So pay attention. The villain plans on setting up his oxygen-destroying ray and then setting it off, killing all of the world's big shots. It's kind of a convoluted plan, but don't overthink it. That's Destructo's job. With the device's place, Destructo releases the ray with devastating results. Down go the big shots, the infrastructure of the country collapsing faster than Dad on a Saturday night. People begin to freak out. I mean, that's not as bad as suddenly being rocketed into space with no oxygen, but, you know, there's still some grumbling. With that, a very Wally Wood-looking stardust appears. He destroys a ray device with a gesture, then sends a counterbeam out to nullify its effects. Destructo gets word his plan has gone awry and panics. And that is completely justified. This stardust guy does not fool around. Well, okay, maybe a little. The hero uses his transformer ray to increase Destructo's head to enormous size. And he's really put out by it, too. But, hey, that's the price you pay when you mess with the kid. His body now completely swallowed by his swollen head, Destructo is then carried off into space. Stardust chucks the offending appendage through the space pocket of living death, where the headless headhunter dwells. And it's a win, the headhunter catching the ball like a touchdown pass. It places the head on its shoulders where it's quickly absorbed into the giant's torso. With that sussed, Stardust heads back to Earth to deal with Destructo's accomplices, although this is pretty anticlimactic after that last bit. Someone has definitely been taking the brown acid. Nearly forgotten after decades of slumber, Hanks came roaring back at the dawning of the 21st century. First came these phenomenal Fantagraphics publications featuring cleaned-up reprints of all-known Hanks stories. Not only are they terrific sources of entertainment, but they've been essential in producing this very video. Following these came John Morris's The League of Regrettable Superheroes, which brought Hank's Phantoma out of the shadows and into the public consciousness. Since then, there's been a Stardust action figure, tribute artwork, and even whispers of some of these characters returning in new comics. It's clear that for all of his faults and foibles, the work of Fletcher Hanks has made an impression. Creative genius or crackpot hack? Hanks remains a polarizing figure. Some are quick to dismiss his efforts, laughing him off as someone without the talent or technique to make a lasting career, while others just as quickly dismiss this criticism, placing Hanks high on their list of influential creators. Whatever your opinion, hopefully you can appreciate the work's inventiveness and raw power. If it was simply a matter of money... Hanks could have just as easily painted more murals or found equally unfulfilling employment, but instead something drove him to produce these stories. There wasn't anything exciting or glamorous about being a comics creator at this point in time. You either did it as a stepping tone for bigger things or because there was nowhere else for you to go.
And while there is some debate about his status as an outsider artist, it is clear that his mind was in another place, far beyond the colorless climes of his age. In my humble estimation, Hanks was a true original, a creator whose example is well worth investigating, if just to see where it leads us. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this program, please consider purchasing a t-shirt, a mug, or one of the other fine items that you can only find at the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics swag shop. I'm Jason Mink, and I hope to see you next Sunday at breakfast. <laughs>